Okay, I think we can get started. It is now 7 p.m. Welcome, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Noble, uh, and I am the manager of donor engagement at Sierra Club BC. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm currently working from my home on beautiful unceded Lekwungen territory in Victoria, BC, also known as Metulia. And where I live here is a Lekwungen food system, also known as a Gary Oak Meadow. And one thing that I've learned about Gary Oak Meadows is that dendrochronology records, which is the study of tree rings, shows that pre-colonial contact, every single tree ring on these Gary Oaks shows evidence of ash, which means that these lands were actively managed using fire to increase the food supply in the form of camas bulbs and acorns. And today the forests here and all across BC are in need of that kind of loving care and attention. And so I'm so grateful for all of you for coming today and for all of your support. For those of you who haven't already, please open the chat box, select all panelists and attendees and introduce yourself to the group, letting us know where you're calling in from and on whose territory you're currently residing. And I encourage you to reflect on what it means to acknowledge the territory where you reside. What might you learn? What do you already know? And please feel free to share these reflections when you introduce yourself. Uh, before we get fully started, I just have some basic housekeeping for this webinar. Uh, first, the webinar is being recorded, so if, if you have to leave early, you can watch the rest later, or if you want to rewatch it, you'll be able to do so as well. Uh, you are welcome to use the chat box throughout the webinar to communicate with each other, but if you want to ask a question of the panelists, please use the Q&A panel, not the chat box. There's too many of you on here for us to monitor the chat. So make sure that the questions go into the Q&A panel, which will be at the bottom of your screen. The questions will be answered uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Sierra Club BC is an environmental charity that recently celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2019. And we would like to acknowledge our accountability uh, to learning from past mistakes um, we have a document and a statement of accountability, which I invite you to read. It's on our website. It's called Balancing the Canoe. And perhaps uh, one of our panelists can put a link in the chat box to Balancing the Canoe in case you're curious and want to uh, learn more about our statement of accountability. Under the leadership of our executive director, Hannah Askew, we are working to fulfill our vision of a healthy, life-sustaining planet where humans respect the di dignity and interdependence of all living beings. And that word interdependence is key and relates directly to Professor Samard's research into forests and how these complex ecosystems function. So next, I'm going to introduce our panelists. First is our guest of honor, Dr. Suzanne Samard a professor of forest ecology at UBC's Department of Forest and Conservation Sciences on Musqueam Territory in Vancouver. Uh, Suzanne studies the surprising and delicate complexity in nature. Her main focus is on the below ground fungal networks that connect trees and facilitate underground intertree communication and interaction. Her team's analysis revealed that the fung fungi networks move water, carbon and nutrients such as nitrogen between and among trees, as well as across species. The research has demonstrated that these complex symbiotic networks in our forests, at the hub of which stand what she calls the mother trees, and they mimic our own neural and social networks. She's also a TED Talk speaker whose presentation has been viewed 4.8 million times, and she's about to have her work even more widely recognized as Amy Adams is set to star in a film adapted from her book. So welcome, Suzanne. Also with us today uh, is Randy Cook, who holds the title of Makwala in the Mamtagila clan of the Kwakwala speaking peoples, holding the responsibility to speak for his family. He is a very recent grad of the Masters of Fine Arts program at the University of Victoria. I believe it was earlier today. Randy has been on a path of exploring many art forms and developed a newfound passion while creating his own signature style. His exploration is about connecting culture and ecology and he discovers a beautiful symbiotic relationship capturing its very essence in new mediums. And I will just add as a fellow artist, Makwala Randy is doing some really amazing and creative work that's both conceptually and aesthetically brilliant. And I'm so happy to have you here, uh, Makwala Randy. 
Uh, and then of course, uh, Jens Feeding, Robin Strong and Flossie Baker are also here from Sierra Club BC. Jens is our senior forest and climate campaigner and science advisor. Robin Strong is Sierra Club BC's forest community li liaison and Flossie Baker is our lead organizer. Welcome everyone. And now I will hand it over to Flossie. Thank you, Elizabeth, and welcome, Suzanne. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's really great to be here. So your book has been out now just over two weeks. Congratulations. Thank you. And it's been getting absolutely rave reviews from what I can tell. And it's really reaching beyond the, the kind of classic environmental and scientific bubbles. And it seems to just resonate with hugely mm -hmm. with people across the board. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, what do you think it is about the ideas in this book that are resonating so much for people at this particular time? There's a number of things. Um, for one, it's storytelling. And I think um, storytelling is how we learn and communicate with each other. Our brains love stories, stories of our origins, stories of, of, of our lives, stories of where we live. Um, and so I tried to tell my story and, um, and that means the story of why I did the science I did and where it led me and what I've learned from so many of the forests and all the people that live in the forest. And I think that people, you know, people love that connection. Everybody knows in their hearts that they're connected. And I have to say that, you know, the most common comment I get from people who have read the work or listened to the TED talk or just email me that they've heard about the work is, is they say, you know, I've always known in my heart that we're connected to the trees and, and that we're all connected together. And so I think it's just has really struck a chord with people, especially after being disconnected during the pandemic so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, it, that really resonates with me. I'm Sierra Club's organizer. And so a big part of my job is to continually try and motivate people to take action. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. can be very um, heartbreaking, very exhausting. And what I appreciated so much about your book was that it reminded me that such a fundamental piece of the action right now for many of us is mm -hmm. working to try and heal our relationships with the mm -hmm the land and the trees and the water. And so I found it personally just incredibly refreshing. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, that healing, you know, our own personal healing and, and how we, you know, how we find our place in the world and uh, as part of the forest, as part of all ecosystems, the waters, the oceans, as we, if we've been disconnected from it, um, it is so healing to reconnect with our homes. They are our homes with our ancestors. They are our ancestors, the trees, the, the salmon, the whales. Um, and it makes you feel whole again. And uh, and I hope that people, everybody can take time. Um, you know, we've had some time now and we I think a lot of people spent more time outside and just go and sit with a tree and, or go sit with a plant or a frog or anything that is, you know, a relation that is maybe not another human being and, and just be with, be with them and, um, and feel that connection and, you know, meld your heart with the heartwood of the trees. And I think that you'll feel, everybody will feel be better immediately. I know that I do this, this is where I get my strength. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, naturally that's what, that's what people do because there are relatives. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Where did your relationship with the trees begin? Well, so I grew up um, in what we call the inland rainforest in British Columbia. The territory is the is the the sort of the overlap of the Okanagan, the Sinaiaks, and the Tanaha nations. Um, I'm actually in Nelson right, right now, which is in the area there where I grew up. So these inland rainforests where um, several nations, you know, lived you know, to, together, or, you know, they're, they're, they who are sort of interwoven together, um, is, is also where I grew up. And, and I, so I lived among these old growth forests, um, the big cedars and hemlocks, the, the iconic, you know, old growth that uh, lots of people around the world think about when they think of British Columbia, this was my home. And um, I was so fortunate. And, um, but I, I, 
I, my family is, was from Quebec and immigrated across Canada um, and landed in, in Maple Lake area. And my great grandfather, Mario Samart was a, was a horse logger and he, all of his sons and then grandsons all were horse loggers as well. And um, I mean, it's a little bit of a, a history, it's a colonization history that, I, you know, my family were settlers um, and it's an, an unfortunate part of the past is that as settlers, we, you know, we were part of the people that were displacing in, in, in the Mabel Air, Lake area, it was the Splatson nation. Um, um, and so there was a bit of a, a disconnect, but I think that my family, um, tried you know they tried to have a lighter touch on the landscape um horse logging is a very light touch it's a selective kind of logging the forests were very regenerative and that's what i saw growing up um and i think that's really fed my soul and what i led me to do my research through the rest of my life mm, yeah i bet so you're you're from three generations of loggers you grew up literally in <laughs> a rainforest it makes complete sense then that you choose yourself mm -hmm. to go into forestry as a young woman and when you get there you write about how shocked you are because the industry mm -hmm. looks so different from what you saw growing up yeah clear cutting has been introduced and I'm just wondering for anyone on this call who's not totally familiar with that practice can you talk a bit about the effect that it that has on the land Yes, absolutely. And just a little bit more historically. So, you know, logging really started in British Columbia, what we now call British Columbia in the late 1800s and started taking off through the early 1900s. And it was really an unregulated period of time um, where it was just a very light touch. There were these what we call JIPO operators like my grandfather and great grandfather, just very small family operations. And then it became more industrialized. And by the time I became a, a forester, which was in the late 70s and early 1980s. Like you said, Flossie, it had changed immensely and logging really was taking off and becoming mechanized. So the first chainsaws actually were invented in the 1950s. And um, my grandfather and uncles were one of the first people that actually used these chainsaws that were like, they were actually double-handed chains or double-sided chainsaws. It's kind of like a sort of like a crosscut saw, but it was a chainsaw. And that was like the beginning of the mechanization. And then there were logging trucks and, you know, and everything sped up and got bigger and bigger and clear cut logging started. And in the 1970s, it was really, you know, it was unregulated. It was kind of felt like a free for all, although there was, you know, there were licenses let, but the, but the clear cuts were huge and they were, they went up the mountains through the valleys. And that's when I got started in the industry. It was the company I worked for was chasing back then the mountain pine beetle that was um, starting, was having an outbreak in the early 1980s. And yeah, it was shocking to see. Um, it was so different than how I grew up. Mm. And that's what got me started on trying to figure out what was wrong with this practice, right? It was so barbaric, it seemed to me, um, compared to what I'd seen and grown up watching. And and there were problems. And I, I um, yeah, I eventually got a job in government trying to figure out what those problems were and what the underlying mechanisms behind those problems were. And that led me eventually to uncover the things that I did. Can you speak briefly about some of those problems that you uncovered? Yeah, so so a clear cut, um, you know, a clear cut is so different than say a wildfire, which people often will, you know, compare these. Um, our forests in North America are generally fire regenerated forests, which means that they, you know, they burn regularly, the fire, the trees, the plants, the animals are all adapted to recovery following fire, regenerating following fire. Um, but fires um, are patchy. They leave old trees behind. Um, lots of creatures survive those fires or they escape the fires. So there's a huge legacy of the past that remains mm -hmm. after a fire. A clear cut, on the other hand, um, takes all the trees. Um, there are no big old trees left behind. In fact, logging, clear cutting is after those big old, old trees, it's, uh, as opposed to the wildfires, which often the big old trees escape those fires because they have thick bark, they've got big tall crowns, um, they're able to survive and live for, you know, hundreds or thousands of years through multiple fire events. Okay. Um, whereas in a clear cut, 
that's not the case. And uh, yeah, and the other thing that happens following clear cutting is planting. So bringing in seedlings that are grown in commercial nurseries. And then when I was starting working in the, in the Ministry of Forests, uh, also spraying and, or herbiciding the native plants to get rid of the native plants because there was such a focus on, on growing trees fast so they could be harvested again in the future. And you know that was all part of the allowable annual cut and you know the, the plan for the province, which I think most people didn't realize at the time and still don't really realize that these plans were laid out in the 1950s to, to basically harvest our working forest, what they call the working forest. So recent when you think about it. Yes, so recent. O only you know really those um, you know those forest commissions that laid out those plans were developed in the, the 1950s so that's only 70 years ago it's not even you know a Douglas fir is only just starting to outgrow its teen years <laughs> when it's 70 years old mm. it's very young in, in the life of a forest. Okay so your incredible research highlights not only the interconnectedness of forests but also something of their behavior and how they communicate. So talk us through this. How exactly does the forest communicate? Yeah, so, you know, I, when I started working in these clear cuts, I was trying to understand what was making the trees sick. Or in, you know, there, in, in the forest I was working in, there was a lot of disease in the forest. I went on later and years later, even as, you know, 10 years ago, looking at some of these plantations and finding there are so many infestations of insects and pathogens. Mm -hmm. And it's to do with, the condition we've left them in. They're, they're, the diversity is lower than in a native forest. Um, and so I started looking below ground to figure out what was going wrong. Mm. And that's when I discovered, you know, that, that there are this other group of fungi called mycorrhizal fungi, which are helper fungi as, as opposed to pathogens, which are, you know, like, par like parasites and um, saprotrophs, which are decay fungi. These are, these are what, you know, I call them helper fungi because they, they actually grow through the soil and pick up nutrients and water and bring them back to the tree and the tree trades photosynthate or energy with them. And it turns out that these fungi not only help the trees grow and survive and, and produce cones and seeds for next generations, they can also link trees together. And so what these linkages do is they, they kind of serve like a big internet below ground. <laughs> um, they're, they're pathways for communication. Mm -hmm. And so trees communicate through these, through these hyphal networks. Um, they do this by um, transmitting resources, water, nutrients, carbon, all the things that plants need to grow. Um, they transmit information about how, how, what, what their identity is, you know, what mm. species they are, um, how related they might be to each other, um, what the health condition, the condition they're in, are they healthy, are they sick, are they shaded, are they in a sunny spot, um, are they, you know, have lots of nitrogen available or not very much. And so there's a, a great deal of perception in those communities of trees of their neighbors, right? There's, there's um, awareness, I, I would call it awareness of each other. Um, really they, and I think that is one of the emergent things out of this discoveries of connections and communication is that these trees are in societies and communication is really key and their relationships with each other is really key to making those societies work. And honestly, they're not that much different than our own human societies in that respect. And I have to say, there's other ways that trees communicate. I look at the below ground communication, but it turns out other researchers are looking at how they also communicate through the air. You know, there's all kinds of, when you're walking in the forest, you smell scents, you can smell blossoms, you can smell pollen, you can smell resins, you can smell terpenes, you can smell all kinds of things. Well, the trees perceive those as well, just like we do. And so they're, they're actually a way of communicating between each other and they can, again, communicate about their stresses, their health, their identity. So, you know, it's sophisticated and it's complex, but it needs to be because these trees, honestly, they live beside each other for hundreds of years. So they've got to, they've got to work it out <laughs> just like we do. Yeah. I want to pick up on that personhood theme you just touched on. Um, you just, you just said it so well, but there's also a gorgeous quote that I just loved and wanted to lift up right now on that. And you write that in many Western societies we've made the assumption that trees don't have instincts they mm. don't cure one another they don't administer care 
But now we know mother trees can truly nurture their offspring. They communicate and send carbon, the building block of life, not just to the mycorrhizas of their kin, but to other members of the community to help keep it whole. They appear to relate to their offspring, as do mothers passing their best recipes to their daughters. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so in essence, this, this quote and what you've just said really alludes to not only the aliveness and the generosity of trees, but also to their personhood. And in recent years, the Klamath River in, in Northern California and the Atrato River in Colombia and the Fanangawi River in New Zealand have all been given the legal rights of personhood. So I'm wondering, could you imagine similar rights being given to forests in this province? And going forward, where do you see the most opportunity to redefine this relationship so that more and more of us can at least begin to imagine this as a possibility? Yeah, I think we have to remember we're in this little blip of time where we feel disconnected. I mean, I think when Randy comes on, he'll talk about the thousands of years or, or I, you know, that, that the nations that have lived here have lived here for thousands of years and have had these deep relationships with forests and trees and plants and all the animals. Um, and that, you know, human beings, we all have for a long, t- you know, we always have had these all over the world. It's just in the advent of Western science and Western civilization that this disconnect I really has really happened and that's come from you know the philosophies arising out of you know Europe out of Greece and Rome and uh and western science and religions and and those have led us to sort of feel you know or to uh I don't know a justification of our separation from nature that that man and women <laughs> are separated from nature that we're superior we have dominion over nature um that you know that we control nature that and and that makes us or that gives us this sort of false uh license or something or false feeling that we are uh disconnected that we that we're you know that we that that nature is inanimate and when we feel that way or when we have this false uh, understanding then that leads us to exploit nature and not be connected and I think that now you know people are realizing as you know we all are the world <laughs> is understanding that we are have gotten to a point of crisis a climatic crisis uh, an extinction crisis and 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 there are you know there are solutions in front of us and I think part of that solution, or the most fundamental part of that solution, is reconnecting to our roots and our genes and to nature. That's the that's the first step forward, and we can all do that. Um, it's all within our hands to do that. Even just in the title of your book, you know, finding the mother tree, that that really simple phrase just the mother tree instantly invites us into a different kind of relationship without maybe even you know realizing it too much yeah yeah it is and you know i it it was um i purposefully um called these big old trees mother trees so that we could connect with these ideas very deeply Mm -hmm. because we all we all have motherhood in us whether we had a mother or we are a mother or we're the child of a mother (laughs) or grandmother um or some kind of family unit that where we have people caring for us and um i think that that helps us connect with the forest because it's these old trees are doing basically the same thing in their own way they're looking after their offspring so that they can succeed and looking after the next generations multiple generations down down the road um and so this idea of motherhood um and caring and um uh, collaboration and networking is is fundamental to how you know it's a it's a way of seeing the world and and living in the world and and I I felt like that term would really help people understand mm-hmm. that and and own it themselves mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and I, I I guess I'll say one more thing Flossie because I, I'm worried that I might forget uh, um is that these, <laughs> <laughs> these big old trees these are ancient some of these are ancient trees right um and mother trees can be, they can be younger too. And, and honestly, any tree can become a mother tree, just like any human being can become um, a mother or a father or a leader in their community or, or, you know, even doing, 
your contributions, carrying out your responsibilities to your community and your and the earth. Um, and old, you know, these old trees, you know, and some of them are thousands of years old, some are hundreds of years old. Um, they have such a special role in ecosystems. And, you know, the old growth forests in British Columbia, across the Pacific coast, all across the world, these old forests are absolutely crucial for us to, to save, to protect, um, because they carry the genes forward of many generations in the past. Mm -hmm. They have the information from previous climates, which will help our forests and us to adapt to future climates. They are the scaffolding for biodiversity. They have, you know, the fungi, just the fungal community alone, which I understand and study the you know, a lot, there are thousands and thousands of species, and some of them only live in old forests. And then the other thing about, you know, all the scaffolding of biodiversity, um, and this oldness, this agedness, this largeness, is also, you know, where carbon is fixed from our atmosphere. These forests, these old trees, continue to grow and, and, and uh, sequester carbon all the time and they are huge huge storehouses hot spots for carbon and biodiversity both the same at the same time in these very very special places mm. wow it sounds like these mother trees can also teach us a lot about dying then maybe, maybe that's maybe that's part yeah. of motherhood but you um You write that my wish is that we might think twice about salvage harvesting the dying mother mm -hmm. trees, might be compelled to leave a portion behind to take care of the young, not merely their own, but their neighbors too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's been heartbreaking for me to watch through my career as every time there is a, you know, a, a cycle of like an insect outbreak or a pathogen outbreak or mm -hmm you know, or a fire or a storm that people go in and they just take those dying trees or those dead trees and turn them into something for money. And we don't give the cycles a chance to carry out the processes that, that they're meant to do. Um, you know, they're, dying is a process, so is living. It's all one big cycle of birth and death and birth and death over and over. And each thing has its important role to play in an ecosystem. One of the things that we discovered in our research in my lab was that as trees are dying, or if you stress them and, um, you know, we've done this artificially by pulling their needles off or, or putting budworms on them and having them chew the needles, that these plant, these trees go through and they start to, they respond, right? They go through all these physiological physiological changes just like we do when we're aging right where mm -hmm. as we age we go through you know I'm getting wrinkles and I'm, <laughs> my hair is getting a little gray and all that so trees go through similar aging processes but they're super important right they and what we found when, when we were stressing trees and, and setting them into a preliminary aging process is that they they would signal send signals to their neighbors about their status that you know I'm I'm on my way I'm sending you information about who I am mm. and what condition I'm in and my energy. And so as they're actually going through that passing process, a lot of that energy is passed directly into their neighbors through these mycorrhizal networks, which is quite different than, you know, than scientists have thought in the past. That it was more like, okay, these old trees are, they're on their way out. They're, they're losing their vigor. They can't photosynthesize as much. And in, in fact, they're decadent. We need to get rid of them. Um, but, and, and then, you know, and salvage logging was part of that process. Um, but it turns out that, you know, a lot of that energy in that dying process is really directed into the next generations. And that's what makes the next generation give it its head start and gives it enough information to go on and have a healthy life into the future. And so we're really, you know, it's almost like with salvage harvesting that we're, we're cutting off that process too early um, and not letting these ecosystems recover and go through this natural mm. cycle of life and death. Mm. And through these um, stress experiments that you did, did you get any insight into how well these old growth forests can still adapt to climate impacts? Yes. So, okay. So the climate, it's it's a it's a real you know it's 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 a difficult thing, right? So, and we've got we've got big challenges ahead of us, and. Um, so I'm doing experiments on big landscape scales to look at climate effects on forests. 
I have this project called the Mother Tree Project, and we're trying to project, you know, what's going to happen in the future, test it. Um, how can we help these forests recover um, and help, help them be resilient? Because, you know, when we look at the, the velocity of climate change and the velocity of migrations in the past and adaptations in the past, you know, trees will not be able to keep up with with how quickly things are changing. Um, they're not gonna be able to adapt and evolve as quickly. They're not gonna be able to you know, pick up their bags and move north because they're stuck in one spot. And so um, really we, you know, this is where human beings, we've got to play, we don't have a choice in, anymore to ignore this. We have to play a role in helping these forests um, be adaptable. So that means moving, moving some trees, moving some genes around, but at the same time, making sure we're moving them into places that are like hospitable, favorable places so that they will survive. And so, you know, and we can do that. We know how to, we know how to do that. That means leaving these old trees to help them out, help the new generations come forward, letting those, their seeds uh, germinate, even if they become maladapted fairly quickly in, in the future, and then bringing in the migrants, bringing in the adopted kids, basically, to you know, that are going to be from warmer climatic regions, so that they all work together to make a healthy ecosystem. Mm. It's got to be done, it's got to be done, it's got to be done with us, you know, we're, we are going to play a really important part in this. Okay, let's shift gears a bit. Um, one of my favorite things about the book is just like how personal it is, how much you share <laughs> about your, your own life story. You, we were there with you when you were this young woman in a very male dominated industry in your 20s. We were there when you were falling in love and getting married in your mum's living room. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was so touched by how vulnerable you were when you lost your younger brother. Mm -hmm. And you raised two kids, you fell in love again, and then you, towards the end of the book, you're diagnosed with breast cancer and mm -hmm. have come on a healing journey with that. And I'm just wondering, um, all this time you were doing this phenomenal research, and over those decades, and as you were uncovering things, were, were you finding that what you were uncovering was helping you make sense of what was going on in your personal life? You know, I, I don't think I really thought of it directly like that, but it did all unwind together. It all, mm -hmm. you know, one thing informed the other. My life informed my research, my research informed my life, even though I wasn't looking for that. It just, it just kind of unfolded that way. Um, and I'm so lucky that it did. I have no regrets. I have, I've learned so much. And I think that all those things that I went through, they led me to ask those next questions. I wouldn't have asked the question of what does a dying mother do for her children unless I was a dying mother looking after my children, although I didn't die, thank goodness. But um, I was, you know, I was going through that process. I, I was looking at what, what am I going to leave behind? What, what about my kids? What, what do I do with them? And, and so then at my grad, when I survived, I had my graduate students, I said, this is what we're going to look at next. And then, you know, the, even the medicine that, that I was given to survive breast cancer, Taxol, Paclitaxel from the U-Tree, I'm now doing research with my graduate students on what makes the U-Tree produce all this beautiful medicine. And what can we do to help the U-Tree produce even, you know, more medicines or in, in, in for the U-Tree, it's their defense, me it's their own medicine too, right? It's their defense. And I think I have this idea that, that their community their neighbors, who they are, you know, how well they're networked with their neighbors, all that plays a role in their own health and ability to produce these amazing compounds. So that's, I did, I would never have asked those questions if I hadn't been through and survived breast cancer because of Paclitaxel. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's none of, none of the, that, I don't know. None of those life experiences went to waste at all. <laughs> I'm using them. I'm they're carrying me forward and um and and it's just been an amazing incredible eye-opening journey for me. And it's kind of weird having my my whole life splayed over, over these pages, but I think I think and what I wanted to do um in writing that way is I wanted to tell the story of 
this science and where it came from and why it was done and that science is a personal it's it's a it's a it's a human thing to do right it's it's innate in us to do these little discoveries to observe things look at variability you know test things we've been doing it for thousands of years and and i think that there is like this distrust of science that, that's in some of the media or some you know corners of the world um, I wanted to try to dispel that, 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 you know, this is all about us, right? This is how we, how we make sense of our world is to do things like science and write and, and make art and poetry and sing. And, you know, it's, it's all part of us making sense of our world. And, and it's, it's, it, you know, anybody can do it and do it from the heart, right? We do it from our hearts. I think the other thing that drove me to write it in this way is that people, other people were writing about my work and it was kind of disembodied. I felt it was so disembodied, like a, like a headless horseman or something. And I wanted to tell the whole story, right? From the beginning to the end, that there is, there is a reason for all this work. There was a reason for these discoveries. They didn't just come from nowhere. It came from my heart and from where I lived and, all, and my ancestors and, you know, and all the people that around me that I grew up with and lived with. Mm, that's beautiful thank you thanks for that question <laughs> <laughs> i'm um i'm talking to you from vancouver tonight and i'm sure there's hundreds of people on this call right now who are joining us from cities and mm -hmm. i grew up in the uk and when i was a kid my family lived in this huge sprawling suburb outside of London and in the whole area there were only two ancient oak trees left and for some insane reason the city decided to build a shopping mall around one of those oak trees and so the tree literally stood there alone surrounded by fake lights and terrible tinny shopping mall music 24 7 and you know shoppers would eat their lunch kind of slumped with all their shopping bags in front of it and when I was five or six every time I saw it I would I would get so upset mm. and I didn't really have the words to be able to describe that at mm -hmm. the time but as I'm growing older and beginning to see my place in the world differently, I'm realizing just how broken and warped my relationship with the trees, the birds, really anyone who isn't human <laughs> has, has become. And I'm, I'm curious to know what you think the mother tree might have to teach us about cities and about mm. our capacity for healing in really, really densely urban places. That's a great question, Flossie. And I think that many people have that same experience. I think what you're experiencing is grief. Mm. You know, you were grieving for that tree. Um, and we, you know, when we're, we see the fires, we see the death in our forests, we see pollution, we, we grieve because this is our home. These are our relatives, right? That you were grieving. And, but there are ways to, to heal this. And that's the amazing thing about our natural world is that it's actually evolved to heal itself right we are in you know we're in this biosphere that's like a self-regulating system that's always adjusting and finding balance it's always seeking balance and those oak trees um that oak tree in the parking lot was probably still producing cones it was probably giving it her all you know just gonna fling those those um, those acorns out and try to produce some new young ones she's going to keep trying and eventually some of those little ones will make it or somebody will carry the acorn somewhere and the and another tree will get started the human being will help out a little flossy will go along and pick up that acorn <laughs> and take it to a park and plant she better it do <laughs> so you know it, it it is we've evolved to heal and that is one thing I learned when I was going through cancer. And I remember my cancer treatments and I was so afraid of dying. Like that oak tree was probably, you know, she, she was suffering. And, um, and I remember my doctor said to me, he said, Suzanne, your body is meant to heal itself. 
And I have taken those words and, and I see that in our forests, I see that in our rivers, I see that in our oceans, they're meant to heal themselves. We just have to, you know, step back and give them space. Like, don't exploit everything. Don't build parking lots all around trees. Give them space to have their families, to carry out their lives, to live in their neighborhoods like we do, because they are social creatures, right? They need their neighbors. They need to have a social life. They need to communicate because that is what gives, it's the relationships that form them, that make them just like they make us and that allows them to heal. Because if, if, we we, if we're alone, we die. Same thing with a tree. If they're alone, it's really tough. But little Flossie, <laughs> up that acorn, or some little Flossies, and that's our role, right? Yes. In the world is to go and help those forests because we, we know what to do. We know that they're wired to heal. Hmm. Thank you. I think we should shift gears again and listen to the passage that you wanted to read to us. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Do you want me to just give a little intro to it? Sure. That would be great. So, um, yeah, I think what you're about to read comes from towards the end of your book, and it's where your research is heading, which is mm -hmm. taking this even further to try and uh, learn about the huge role that salmon play in this interconnected mm -hmm. web. It's, it is a great, it's a great example. Um, okay, this is uh, starting on page 289. Um, and the chapter is called Passing the Wand. Okay, here we go. I was in Bella Bella on the mid coast of British Columbia in the salmon forest of the Haltzik people. Our skiff glided into a pristine inlet, and our Haltzik guide, Ron, pointed to, an oak, to ochre pictographs marking a clan territory. Silken Pacific mist poured down the vertical rock wall and over the monumental trees. With me were Alan the Rock, my new doctoral student who would be investigating the patterns of fungal networks, and postdoctoral fellow Dr. Teresa Ryan, or Simhayetsk, of the Simsian Nation the people of the Skeena to the, to the north. T Teresa is a traditional cedar basket weaver, as well as a salmon fishery scientist on the Canada-US Pacific Salmon Commission Joint Chinook Technical Committee, among the many hats she wore. She wanted to know as an Aboriginal person and a scientist, whether restoring the traditional fishing practices using tidal stone trap technology could reinvigorate the salmon populations, perhaps to levels seen before the colonists took control of the fishery. This in turn might nourish the cedars from which she gathered bark. We were in search of the bones of salmon carried into the forest by the bears and wolves and eagles. The bones were all that were left once the flesh was eaten and the residual, residual tissue decayed, nutrients seeping into the forest floor. In this inlet, Dr. Tom Reimkin of the University of Victoria and Dr. John Reynolds of Simon Fraser University had discovered Simon, salmon nitrogen in rings of cedars and Sitka spruces and in the plants, insects, and soils. Alan would start our study of how mycorrhizal fungi might transmit the salmon into the trees and possibly between trees by determining how the mycorrhizal fungal communities differed alongside streams with various salmon population sizes. Could a difference in the fungi in their ability to transmit the salmon nutrients help account for the greater fertility of these rainforests? I could barely contain my excitement as Alan, Teresa and I jumped into the sedges with our hip waders and headed to shore. Bear path, said Teresa, pointing at a trail. They've been here recently. Let's keep going, I said, like a dog pulling on its leash. We easily followed the trail into the wall of Salmonberry along the shore where the prickly canes stood thick. After half an hour of crawling on hands and knees in the humus, Teresa suddenly said, you guys are nuts. You're asking for trouble with these fresh bear signs. She headed back to the boat to wait with Ron. I looked at Alan to gauge his comfort level. And he didn't seem nervous. 
If I were a bear, I'd take my salmon to where I wouldn't be disturbed, I said, thrilled he was up for the adventure. We kept crawling along through a tunnel carved in the salmon berries toward a 50 meter tall cedar on a high bench. Her leader forked in a candelabrum with the haltzik called a grandmother tree. <laughs> Each bear preying on the salmon spawning, spawning, preying on spawning salmon transported some 150 fish a day into the forest where the roots of the trees foraged for the decaying protein and nutrients, the salmon flesh providing more than three quarters of the tree's nitrogen needs. The nitrogen in tree rings derived from salmon was distinguishable from the soil nitrogen because fish at sea get enriched with the heavy isotope nitrogen 15, which serves as a natural tracer of salmon ab abundance in the wood. Scientists could use the year-by-year -year variation in tree ring nitrogen to find correlations between salmon populations and changing climate, deforestation, and shifting fishery practices. An old cedar tree could hold a thousand year record of salmon runs. I shouted, Yoo-hoo! as we approached the ledge of the grandmother tree, despite my call being muffled by a wall of salmonberry leaves. A grizzly out here would mean a quick death. Alan and I crept up and perched along the bench. Putain de merit, I shouted, look! Under the boughs of the old mother tree was a cozy mossy bed large enough for a mama bear and her cub. Dozens of white salmon skeletons gleamed from the carpet, the flesh long decayed, the vertebrae unhinged, the fine corsets of bones folding like butterfly wings, the scales and, and gills asunder, the essence of the fish slowly absorbed by the roots, transmitted into the wood of the tree, passed to the next life. Tree bones. I'll keep going a little longer. Okay. Alan and I collected soil from under the bones and for comparison from places where there were no bones. We returned to Teresa and Ron, escaped the bears, jumped onto the boat from the high tide line and, storing, and stored the samples on ice to prevent the degradation of the microbial DNA. Ron puttered away along the shore and skimmed over the stone wall that followed the contour of the shoreline from one edge of the estuary to the next. The wall was one of hundreds of tidal stone traps built along the Pacific coastline by the Haltzik people, similar to those built by the Dachanlith, the Kwakwakawa, the Simsian, the Haida, and the Tlingit nations to, har to harvest salmon passively, keep track of the populations, and adjust harvests accordingly. They collected the fish trapped at low tide, releasing the biggest egg-bearing females to continue up the river to spawn. They smoked, dried, or cooked the fish, buried the guts in the forest floor, and returned the bones to the waters to nourish the ecosystem. This practice enhanced the salmon populations and the productivity of the forests, the rivers, and the estuaries. The forests, rich with salmon, returned the favor by shading the rivers, shedding nutrients into the waters, and providing habitat for the bears, wolves, and eagles. Teresa explained that when the colonists took jurisdiction of the waters in the forests, they forbade the use of the stone traps. The salmon were overfished within two decades and left and have yet to recover. Climate change and a warming of the Pacific Ocean have created a new, pro new problems by exhausting the fish on their marathon from the ocean, reducing their success at reaching the natal spawning streams. It's part of a general pattern of destroying in interconnecting habitats. To the north on Haida Gwaii, the last of the cedars, some more than a thousand years old, are being clear-cut on Graham Island, leaving the forests along the spawning rivers degraded and the Haida wondering what will happen to their way of life. When will this stop, this unraveling? As we sped out of the inlet toward Bella Bella, Ron pointed to a humpback surfacing a few hundred meters away. From out of nowhere, dozens of white-sided dolphins joined our boat, arcing over the water, somersaulting and whistling to one another. I was so astonished, so uplifted that I stood, Alan and Teresa too, as the salt water splashed over us. Mm -hmm. This study is ongoing, but our early data shows that the mycorrhizal fungal community in the salmon forest differs depending on the number of salmon returning to their natal streams. 
We still don't know how far into the forest the mycorrhizal network is transporting the salmon nitrogen, and if or how restoration of this tidal stone traps might affect forest health. But we're starting new research and reconstructing some of the stone walls to find answers. I've been wondering too, if we should check whether salmon also nourish the mainland forests from rivers that run inland. Do spa spawning salmon feed the birches and cedars and spruces along the rivers that run thousands of kilometers into the mountains, such as along the Adams River running below my experiment. Salmon in this way, connecting the ocean with the continent. The Shwepamak people knew how vital salmon was to the interior forests and to their livelihoods, and they cared for the populations according to the far-reaching principles of interconnectedness. That's the perfect place to end, I think. And I'm so sorry to say this, Suzanne, but I think you're going to have to write another book. <laughs> because those questions are just too good to go unanswered. Yeah. I am actually writing another book, so there will be more answers in the Great. next book. Great, we'll pick up this stories. conversation then. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was such a treat to have you read to us. Thank you. And um, we're going to have to hand it over to our other panellists tonight, but thank you. It was a thank huge you so much, pleasure Flossie. and a real honour to talk with you this evening. Likewise. Thank you both. Flossie, you're, you're an excellent uh, interviewer. You could do this professionally. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, and thank you, Suzanne. That was um, really touching in many ways. Um, I'm very excited to now invite um, Makwala Randy Cook to share uh, some of his experience as an Indigenous person and as an artist and as the uh, title holder who has the responsibility for speaking for his family. Welcome, Randy. Thank you. It's an honor to be here today. So thank you to the Sierra Club of BC for asking me to come and be a part of this. Thank you to Suzanne for all of your amazing work. Um, you know, what can I say, really? Um, other than, we are literally in a time right now where the world is watching this, you know, in the middle of a crisis. And what are we doing essentially to speak to the land and Mother Earth? So I'm coming to you today from the land of the Lekwungen, Esquimau, the Saanich peoples. I'm uh, sitting outside, enjoying, you know, the sky, nature all around me, and listening to this beautiful talk. Um, my research actually within my MFA program brought me to Suzanne. Um, I'm Kwakwa Kiwok. Um, my birth name is Galapa. And my connection to the land has been something that I was born into from the very beginning. Um, I was always raised as a Kwakwa Kiwok person, um, culturally, that all of our gifts were birthed from the forest. And you know, I'm a Hamatsa, and I was initiated at the age of 11. And in initiation, we go out into the forest and we fast for four days. And we bathe and we cleanse. But it's also a time of meditation. And in that meditation process, we strive to reach higher consciousness. In that higher consciousness is really about connecting with the environment. It's essentially a reset button that our ancestors placed um in front of us like it's it's a really significant culture that i come from that we were able to recognize at any moment we do have a reset button and we lived in a time of sustainability and that's something that i started to look at and yearn for so i started to walk my traditional territories again getting out on the land and what i started to recognize was that um, the impacts of logging we're wiping out a lot of our traditional territories where a lot of these gifts came from. Um, and then I started to ask questions around culturally modified trees, you know, um, culturally modified trees birth, you know, so much in regard to ceremonies. And then I started to go into museums within urban settings and I would see cedar bark rings and sacred regalia, all of these things behind glass cases that were really sacred to us as Kwakwakiwag people. 
Then I started to make that connection. That bark might've been pulled from that tree in my territory a thousand years ago. And now that tree is cut down. Who are we as Kwakwakiwog people without that connection? That was my biggest concern. So I started going to origin stories and I started to read these prayers and they were so profound because every prayer would start before the, the harvesting of bark. I breathe life into you as you breathe life into me. It was about this connection and it was, it was there. There was this recognition of life and trees and everything. So I kept thinking, my God, like, how do I revive this information? And then I stumbled into Suzanne Smart, you know, and her work on tree communication. And I was so excited because I was like, now somebody is speaking the same language we have always spoken for thousands of years. So I called her up out of the blue and I was like, hey, how's it going? I'm Randy Cook. I'm doing a master's. I'm an artist. And, you know, I want to connect with you. And anyway, we got into this really great conversation. And I think after like two hours, you know, Suzanne, thank you for everything. Because Suzanne goes, Randy, that is the foundation of the work that I'm doing. The Indigenous people lived within a sustainable practice. They understood the elements. They understood the force, the energy. You know, like for me, I was like, it, it was just it was the reconciliation I was looking for. It was, you know, all of this talk in Canada, it was the reconciliation I was looking for to make me feel good in the work that I was doing and how we as Indigenous people can move forward. So essentially, I started to recognize that there is a language in science. There is a relationship that we can form. And through the work that Suzanne is doing, I'm so excited to bring the work that I'm doing from our ancient knowledge into this contemporary time where we can share conversations all on the same level of what preservation is and the importance at this time during this time of crisis where we essentially we're down to 3% and we need to make some change. And, you know, again, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak. And again, thank you, Suzanne. You know, I'm so excited to be working with you and be a part of, you know, your team as you can be a part of my team, the Tree of Life, and everybody else at Sierra Club. You guys are doing amazing work. Um, but, you know, like more than anything, get out, as everybody's saying, get out into nature. Connect with the trees. Connect with the elements. Connect with the animals. That's the attention that is needed. You know, we talk about healing. We talk about all of these different components, these factors that are severing our ties and essentially creating illnesses. But we are responsible for that healing element to be a part of our lives. We are in control. We have that choice. And I think right now the conversation is all around us. And I just want to say thank you again. Gila Kesla. Gila Kesla on behalf of me, my family. And, you know, the Kwakwakwo people, everybody that I work with, you know, who care about the environment, who care about old growth, who understand that there is energy, there is communication and all of it. And essentially fungi to us, what I'm starting to understand is that thin veil that we've always spoken about as Kwakwakwo people between the supernatural and the natural. They are the connecting elements. And that is something that is so profound for us when we talk about that thin veil that we understand that there is something beyond greater that we can't control. And, you know, and there's those connecting elements that bring those messages back and forth. And that's what the fungi is doing and educating us. So I just want to say thanks again. Gila Kessler. Thank you. Andy, for, Andy. for those of uh, people who can't uh, see it on the chat, where can we learn more about your art and your work? Um, yeah, so anyway, I, I do have a website. It's randycook at leafmodern.ca. I have a gallery, uh, www.leafmodern.ca. And I think it's, yeah, probably just Googling Randy Cook and stuff too. I'm kind of working really hard. I'm really pushing right now. And um, this is a really big passion of mine of bringing this, bringing the information back to what it is that, you know, is needed at this time in regard to the environment.
And I feel for us as indigenous people, um, when we look at indigenous art, it was the language, it was there, you know, it was the way we spoke to that connection within the environment. And my, my goal is to bring that information back again, connected to the art. So when people do see the contemporary art that I'm working on, that is my goal, that's my objective, is to really bring the essence through and to bring it into a new way that we can all explore and connect because I think bridge building is really important. Um, we are collective now within Canada. You know, I, I keep bringing it back to reconciliation and what that means, but it is a collective, you know, choice we have to make when it comes to the environment. And this is something we have to look at globally. You know, it's not about race anymore. It's not about, you know, division. It's really about celebrating diversity in the way we look at the land, but really essentially placing the land above all else because without it we are nothing and I think that's what we've always known as Indigenous people so I keep saying for us as Indigenous people now is the time where we can share that information we can help to educate non-Indigenous people in Canada to really talk about you know the importance of sustainability and what it meant to us from our very beginnings you know and and not to let this last 150 years of colonization just you know have the last word you know i think we're in a time where we can push that reset button as we've always known as indigenous people so you know so we can all take a breath and we can do some work together collectively thank you thank you for that invitation and i hope everyone will go and check out randy's work it's really incredible um, we have a bit more of our program this evening. Up next is uh, Robin Strong, our forest community liaison, who is going to talk a little bit about what's up in the woods today. Thanks, Elizabeth. Oh, hi, everyone. My name is Robin Strong, and yes, I'm the uh, Sierra Club's community liaison. I'm also a registered forest technologist. So I went to school for forestry and I've spent most of my career working in forestry. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay. All right, so tonight I'm going to be talking about the current state of old forests in BC. So I'm going to start by giving you a few statistics about what's left, and then I'm going to talk about the old growth strategic review. And finally, I'll just leave off with a little bit about what Sierra Club BC is doing about this issue. So the old forests that I'm talking about tonight are old growth forests that have big trees. There's lots of different types of old forests and not all of them have big trees. So the ones that you're going to think about tonight are those ones with the, the big, beautiful trees. So the reason that they get this way is because they have certain site conditions. So they don't receive a lot of natural disturbances like wildfires or windstorms. So this allows them to grow really old. They also have these really good growing conditions with lots of nutrients and moisture, which lets them grow really big. These forests are rare, both on a global scale and also on a provincial scale. So only 10% of our, our provincial land can support the growth of this type of forest. And because they have such high timber values, they're also disproportionately targeted for logging. So 92% of these forests have already been logged. All that's remaining is an area that's about six times the size of the greater Victoria area. So if we drill down a bit, um, within this type of forest, we can look at the most productive forests in BC. So these are the forests that grow the biggest, oldest trees. So you can think about a place like Cathedral Grove, for example. These forests are even more rare. Only 3% of forests were ever this type. They're also more targeted for logging. So we've logged 97% of them with only 3% remaining. This is about 36,000 hectares or um, about half the size of the Greater Victoria area. And unfortunately, most of these forests are still available to be logged. So I'm getting these statistics from a peer reviewed report that was just released this year. And Maya's gonna link that in the chat for you at the end of this webinar. 
So there's been quite a lot of interest, public interest and concern about old growth forests in the last few years. And our government took note of that a few years back and they decided to convene a panel to look at the issue. So this is called the Old Growth Strategic Review. And they hired two foresters to travel around the province and ask British Columbians uh, why they care about old growth forests and what needs to be done in order to protect them. The report that they released last year is called A New Future for Old Forests. And for me, it was, I thought it was a really good report. I had a bit of a feeling of pride for these foresters because what they're calling for is something that is totally deviating from the status quo. And that takes a lot of strength. So what they're calling for is a complete paradigm shift in forestry. They had 14 recommendations that lay out a plan for how to do this. And John Horgan had actually promised that he would implement all of these recommendations back in 2020. But unfortunately, he hasn't been following through on this promise. So what we're calling for is for our, our government to fully implement this old growth strategic review. And I wanna draw your attention to just four of these uh, recommendations that need to happen right away. So the first recommendation in the report calls for the provincial government to fully involve indigenous communities and indigenous nations in this change as we go forward. Recommendation six is also really important in the report. And this one calls for deferrals. So we're looking for an immediate halt on logging in any forest that only has 10% of its old growth forest left. We also need to fully protect any ancient forests from logging. So that would be any forest on the coast that's older than 500 years old, or any forest in the interior older than 300 years old. We're calling on the government to create a work plan with milestone dates for how they're going to get to this paradigm shift. And that's really important for accountability. And finally, we're looking for funding. This funding is really important so that Indigenous communities can have economic alternatives. And it's also important for forestry workers and for forest dependent communities because they need to have some form of hope for the future as they move through this change. So what is Sierra Club BC doing about this issue? We're doing lots of things in lots of different ways, but I wanna talk about one way that we're making change. This is called relational organizing. What this is, is leveraging the power of relationships that we already have in our network. So to give you an example, we have about 30,000 members of Sierra Club BC, and we're working to have better relationships with each of those members so that we can listen to what their concerns are, listen to their ideas, and work to inspire them to take some kind of action. So some of these actions can be really simple, like just talking to their neighbors or their families about old growth forests, but those can also be really powerful. So if we can engage just 5% of our membership, that's 1,500 people across the province that are doing something. And that's really hard to ignore. So I think I'm gonna leave it there for tonight. I know that some of you have a burning question, which is what can I do about this issue? So I'm gonna pass it off to Flossie again, and she's going to give you a bit of inspiration there. Thank you so much for listening and uh, Flossie, you can take it away. Thank you, just bear with me while I share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, if you have been moved by anything that you have heard tonight and wish to do more to do your part in helping to um, take care of these precious forests, then we have some ideas for you. And don't panic, everything that I'm about to say will be sent to you in an email. So no scrambling for pens and paper. The first thing that you can do is to, si to sign up to our new action portal. And what I've got on the screen at the bottom of it is a screenshot of what a part of it looks like. And signing up to this is really, really, really important because we have designed it to try and take as much transformative action as possible. 
it might look a little bit different to what you're expecting and that is completely on purpose because this is also an invitation into a different kind of relationship. So if you go to this portal, you'll be asked to join one of five groups, the artists and storytellers. So anyone who loves to paint or sing or dance or draw, you don't have to be any good. It doesn't matter. You just have to enjoy it. The benefactor group is for anyone who wants to donate money or time or, or an in-kind venue. The ambassador group is what I like to call the social butterflies, people who love to host picnics or parties, or maybe they want to get their faith organization more involved. Maybe they want to get better at storytelling and public speaking. If you join this group, we will help you do that with whatever circle you're a part of. And then we have the nurturers group. And this is for anyone who is helping to raise kids in any way. You're already doing the most important job and we want to support you. So this is for teachers, for parents, for grandparents, for caregivers. And if you join this group, you will be sent a bunch of really inspiring resources that you can do with your kids really easily at the playground or, or on your front porch even to help them connect more deeply to the land that they're on. And finally, the innovator group is for anyone who really wants to take action but doesn't see their idea reflected in one of the other groups. If you join this group, we will do our best to support your vision and bring it to life. So the reason why we're building these groups really intentionally this summer is so that when there is a big political moment, we can all come together and there will be hundreds of artists creating art for it and hundreds of dinner parties happening in living rooms across the province and thousands of school kids with their teachers and other community leaders all acting together. But between those moments, so much magic will be happening. We will be offering all kinds of different events, art classes, walks, conversations that will help us relearn and remember our interdependence with the trees and the water. Now you will have the option to be as involved as much or as little as you like. It truly doesn't matter. All that matters is that you are needed at this time and we will learn together as we go. So please, if you do one thing this week, go to this website and join a group. I'll see, what is the website? The website is going in the chat. Right. It will be there, don't worry. Okay, and for the people who uh, will only see this on the recording, can you share that as well? Okay, so do grab your pen and paper. <laughs> www.invitetoaction, all one word, .ca. Thank you. The next thing you can do once you've done that is to tune in again on June the 1st, we will be holding a learn to draw the mother tree drawing webinar with a really, really cool uh, illustrator and Suzanne Samad herself will be back and we will actually be drawing the mother tree and all of the beings that are connected to her together. You don't want to miss that. This is the perfect pandemic event that the whole family will enjoy. Um, and lastly, buy her wonderful book, buy it for everyone you know, buy it for teachers, buy it for friends, uh, buy it from your local booksellers, you won't regret it. And that's all from me, back to you Elizabeth. Thank you so much Flossie, uh, and thank you everyone. I, I really do hope that you'll visit invitetoaction.ca and um, I hope that we can continue this new kind of a relationship together. So now it is time for questions. And uh, we have questions both that have been submitted in the Q&A panel. And uh, we have some people watching live on Facebook as well. So uh, we also, yeah, we have Jens here who's here to answer question and we have uh, Suzanne. So let's see, we have the top question. We have a war in the woods in BC right now, trying to protect the remaining old growth and its biodiverse habitats. Uh, what can you suggest for us in getting through to the government? Uh, who wants to tackle that one? Yes, 
Jens, is that for you? I, I can try. It's one of the hardest questions, it, it seems. Um, I, I hope Suzanne might also share some thoughts, but it, it is truly frustrating that it's so difficult. But that being said, there's also so much momentum and we all we are all witnessing it tonight with about 1000 people um, who, who care about the forest and we have done some polling two years ago showing that more than 90 percent of British Columbians uh, want change and we have these intertwined crises we have the uh, um, species disappearing we have the climate crisis we have a social justice crisis and uh, the strong movement for indigenous rights um, black lives matter in, in north america so all these things coming together and it's almost like we have um, the majority of us understanding the change understanding how we must respond and a small group of people unfortunately some of them in power who are stuck in the past and are not realizing how quickly um, people are responding to um, the, the change we are witnessing in, in with climate biodiversity and so on. Um, I, I'm convinced that we are very close to tipping points and we have to keep doing what we are doing and um, bring more people into the tent. Um, we already heard about a number of of opportunities to join the movement. It's often a difficult um, decision to find out what will be best, what works best for you. Um, one thing that we, we are talking a lot about and are helping a lot um, with is um, meeting with MLAs. It's one of the most important things we can all um, try either by um, requesting meetings or um, joining with others to request meetings, sending personal letters, um, lots of opportunities to, to send messages via online action platforms that you all have seen. So I'm, I'm convinced that um, we have momentum and that change is around the corner, but we have to keep going and we, um, we really um, have to um, make sure that um, our current government cannot get away with ignoring this any longer. That's great. Do you have anything to add to that, Suzanne? I, I concur with everything that Yen said. Um, you know, I've worked in all sectors, <laughs> except for I haven't worked in an NGO, but I've worked in government, I've worked in industry, I've worked in academia, and you can't stand, be a bystander. I mean, I think that it, you know, in all of those sectors, working on the inside, unless you're really active and vocal, it it really has no effect. You know, and and I don't mean that in a discouraging way. I mean it as an, an encouraging way. Is that um, stop being a bystander and be active in whatever way and capacity you can. It can be small and it can be big. Um, some people will take on those big mother tree roles, and we need that. That's how networks work. That's how systems work. And so, you know, donating money to the Sierra Club is really good or Greenpeace or, you know, the, the, the change makers and uh, supporting the protesters um, is really important. Supporting people who are getting the word out, even like if you're, if you don't have much, but donate five bucks, you know, it all helps. Um, teaching your kids, teaching your grandchildren, teaching your neighbors, it all helps. That's how networks work. And the amazing thing about systems like this, natural systems, and I study systems a lot, is that they slowly change and suddenly there's a, a tipping point, as Yen said. They can be, you know, we think of tipping points as scary negative things, but they also work the other way that when you start putting good policies in place and you start building momentum, then suddenly you can get big positive changes. And I agree, I think we're at the cusp of a big change. I agree with Randy, we're at a reset opportunity here. And, and I haven't seen this, you know, I've been around for quite a long time. I haven't seen this since the war in the woods at Clyquet Sound. We've got a lot of momentum here. So let's keep going, keep pushing and, it, and change will, it will happen. Thank you. Yeah. And we have a whole bunch of ideas for ways that you can continue to put pressure in our um, 30 ways to take action on sierraclub.bc.ca. Uh, um, you know, paint a postcard and mail it to your MLA. 
uh, you know, get on TikTok and uh, record a video, you know, anything that you do will continue to add to the momentum. So don't be discouraged. Millions of small actions really do add up. Um, okay, the a next question, an urban question. Do fungal networks make their way under urban streets to connect trees uh, on the opposite side of the street? Do you have any information on that, Suzanne? I laugh because I get asked that question so much. And I think, um, and I, you know, I, I've never studied this, but I'll tell you what I think. You know, trees, trees are, and fungi, fungi are the link between the soil and the, and the trees, the, the, between the CO2 in the air and the carbon in the ground. And that's the energy source that fuels everything, the soil food webs, which drives the nutrient cycles. And, you know, if you don't have good soil, it's really hard to keep those cycles going. And urban areas and urban development, you know, a lot of, there's not a lot of attention to soil and a lot of trees are planted in what I call fill or gravel or, you know, not very living soil. That said, trees are incredible, right? They have this huge energy source that feeds the soil and the soil food web will start generating and growing and growing fungal networks. And, you know, tree, they're incredible. You know, you can, you've even seen, I'm sure everybody's seen tree roots that have buckled up sidewalks and buckled up pavement and they will grow under and those roots and fungi will connect as long as there's a pathway there. And there's so much we can do within our urban environments to, uh, to, to make it better, to make it healthier. One is like, you know, as I keep saying, trees are social creatures like us. They like to grow in families and communities. And in urban areas, we tend not to do that. We, we plant them in isolation or in rows or, you know, without very many other trees around them. And I think that's one place we can start to change those practices to make healthier forests in our urban environments that are connected and they and yes then they can actually connect underground underneath streets and form that community that will filter water clean the air you know house some biodiversity even maybe store some carbon in, in urban areas thank you excellent um as someone who from a family of foresters and having worked in the industry, what is your vision for a truly sustainable, regenerative, equitable forestry sector here in BC? What does that mean to you? Well, there's some fundamental things that need to be done and I'll say right off the top, um, our rate of cut of forest harvesting in this province is way too high. It needs to come down. It's been creeping up and creeping up over the over the decades, and um, in the name of all kinds of reasons, the mountain pine beetle, the wildfires, um, you know, jobs, of course, is always right there in the forefront. Um, but we need to reduce that cut because it's unsustainable and it's actually making our planet sick. And um, but you know, we can still harvest some trees, but we need to get more value out of what we do harvest. I know that's everybody says that, but it's true. Um, and um, and then also value the forest for other things other than just harvesting them, right? There's a whole range of ecosystem goods and services. There are life support systems and we need to start valuing forests for those things. And, and actually, you know, how do we do that? Well, you know, we can say it, but we actually, in our economic system, we actually got to put, our, you know, put our money where our mouth is. And that means putting a dollar value on things that protect those, that umbrella of goods and services. And I think that, um, valuing our one of those indicators, which is very handy because we all understand how this works, is carbon. Carbon is a good umbrella for water and air and biodiversity. They're all correlated. And so that is one economic tool that we can use to value the forests, you know, to, to actually preserve them and conserve them. And, um, and then where we do harvest, you know, in that smaller cut base that we need to reduce down to, um, get more value out of it and also leave old trees, leave legacies. You know, the, our current status quo of clear cutting and, uh, and, and cleaning out these plantations and growing these sort of clean plantations is not working and it's not going to work. So we've got to revamp how we're going to do forestry practices as well. That's what I think. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Jens, do you have anything to add to that? 
No, but I wanted to quickly um, highlight for folks who are asking for, looking for information, how to prepare for meetings with MLAs. There was a follow-up question in, in, the, in the chat, um, just pointed out the link to our media center. So we, we have, for example, the March 11 media release highlighting a report card with five things the BC government must address to catch up on implementing the panel report. And just today, a group of ecologists shared a map showing the at-risk forest that needs deferral. So th there are some great material um, and examples of things you can use for your meetings with MLAs. Great, thank you for that, Jens. And, and if you ever do have questions, if you wanna meet with your MLA and you don't know what to say, send us an email, send me an email and I'll give you a pep talk. <laughs> Happy to help with that. Um, Okay, we have just a little bit more time. Um, let's see, what do you anticipate could be the impact on our forests with the decline in salmon populations? Can you speak to that quickly? Well, you know, we're, uh, all of our, the, the whole landscape is a salmon forest. You know, rivers run through Western Canada, and in those rivers are salmon that are migrating. Um, and so they're, you know, the salmon are integrated with our forests deeply all through, all through. Um, we don't even really, you know, from a scientific point of view, Western science point of view, don't we don't even have a good grasp of how tight that connection is. But, um, but you know, what we do know every time we look or if we listen to um, our First Nations people, we know those linkages are crucial and tight and important. Um, and so restoring salmon populations is the same as restoring our forests. And, you know, the, the forest will, as the salmon declines, the, the forest declines. As the salmon rebuild, the forests rebuild. So they're all one and the same and connected. So we've got to restore them all together. It's almost like they're the um, fungi network that connects the ocean and and the forest. Yeah, I think that you know the the, the fungi are are uh, are important, but they're they're also like a metaphor for all the connection at various scales, at landscapes, at the to the soil crumb scale, from minutes to decades to millennia. They're all you know they're, those connections are ubiquitous. It's like a fractal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we are at 827 and this just flew by. What an amazing evening. Thank you so much for being here, Suzanne. I know uh, Randy had to drop off early and he thanked everyone. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues uh, for supporting this evening tonight. And I wanna thank absolutely everyone for joining us. And I do invite you to continue um, to explore this new relationship uh, that we're, <laughs> Uh, hoping to build. And um, I just want to uh, share quickly that uh, you can continue to reach out to us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the handle at sierraclub.bc, or excuse me, it's just at sierraclubbc. And uh, our new engagement portal is invitetoaction.ca. Our general website is sierraclub.bc.ca. And lastly, we are 100% funded through donations and grants uh, with the generosity of people like you. So thank you all for being here. And I do invite you to make a donation if you can to our work to protect forests. Um, all of the donations that you give are tax deductible as we're a registered charity. And so you're welcome to go online to sierraclub.bc.ca and make a donation. And uh, thank you for whatever you decide to do. Your voice is needed, your time is needed, your care and attention is needed. And we are so grateful that all of you could join us this evening. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sierra Club. And thank you, everybody, for, for being here today. And thank you, Randy. And thank you, all the nations that were here together. Good night, everybody. Thank you.